This video is sponsored by Audible. For quite a while now, there's been a debate within certain political circles about, well, debate. A couple years ago, many of my YouTube colleagues pondered the merits of debating the ideas of the alt-right. Some people argued that it was necessary to take harmful ideas to task in a public arena, while others feared that giving any kind of platform to these people would cause more harm than good. And these kinds of conversations seem to pop up over and over with no real resolution. Whether we're talking about the worst ideas of the alt-right or other kinds of political anxiety, there's still a tension between those who think that some political topics are simply beyond debate and those that think that no such concept even exists. Now obviously, talking about politics and social issues and things of that nature is something that is necessary. But if it's not done in an effective way, it becomes unproductive if not counterproductive. So then we must decide, when is debate useful if it is at all? And should progressives and leftists be doing more of it? Hi, I'm T1J. Follow me. So there's been kind of a campaign over the last few years to try and convince people, especially people on the political left, to embrace civil debates with people they disagree with. NPR recently published an article expressing advice about how to have conversations with political opponents without ending up killing each other. The article was mostly fine, but many people on Twitter who almost certainly didn't actually read it took offense to its title. For some people, politics seems to be a game of good versus evil. So the concept of common ground with political opponents seems unthinkable. And some people are astonished by the mere suggestion that they should ever have to defend their positions. If you can't tell by my tone, I think this is a pretty faulty mindset. If you ever reach a point where you feel that you are beyond scrutiny and your ideas and the things you believe are self-evidently true and can never be challenged, you're probably fucking up. Whether or not you choose to participate in debates, you should always be open to the idea that your perspective could be more evolved, because it probably could. That's kind of the nature of being an imperfect human being. But I also find it interesting that when some people hear the phrase political disagreement, they automatically think of neo-Nazis and transphobes and the worst examples of extreme politics. Because a political disagreement can mean a debate about the merits of universal basic income, or about whether a city should build a new library. The fact that so many people think about politics as this extreme black and white heroes versus villains situation does a disservice to nuanced discourse. This is not Avengers, you ain't Chris Hemsworth. But one thing that is missing from that NPR article is an argument for why civil debate is even necessary in the first place. Like why should we debate? And why should we be civil when we do it? If you come to believe something, especially if that belief was based on earnest truth seeking or even your own lived experience, it's very unlikely that someone is going to change your mind about that in a debate. And is civility so great anyway? I mean revolutions aren't civil. The Civil War wasn't civil, ironically, but it still seemed inevitable and necessary. A lot of people are proponents of debate because of this concept known as the marketplace of ideas. It's an extension of the general support for freedom of speech and freedom of expression. The idea is that we allow everyone to express whatever thoughts and ideas they believe, and then we debate those ideas, often in front of public eyes and the best and most true ideas will naturally gain the most favor and be adopted and accepted by society in a similar way that the best products generate the most demand in a capitalist market. The problem with this is that it is demonstrably not true in either case. Artificial demand for inferior products can be created in many ways, such as advertising or other more underhanded methods. Likewise, the ideas that become adopted by a society that values free expression are not necessarily the best or most true. The Pew Research Center found that Americans are the most tolerant of free speech out of the 38 countries they polled. Although to be fair, this was in 2015 before Donald, the media is the enemy of the people, Trump became president. However, Americans have more widespread doubt than many of those other countries about things like the efficacy of vaccines and evolution, even though they are proven facts. So obviously, more free speech does not necessarily lead to more truth 
which seems to imply that more debate doesn't either. In fact, it may have the opposite effect. Now I should say, I am a huge free speech guy. While I don't think that the best ideas naturally magically rise to the top, I do think that free and open expression allows the best ideas to be heard in the first place. And I think it's important for speech and expression to be protected because sometimes the best ideas are unpopular. And it takes a society, a generation, or two, or ten, to realize that they were the right ideas. It just then becomes our job to make a convincing case. And that's kind of the problem with debate anyway. If all you needed to win a debate was to be right, or even to have the most sound argument, then debates would be easy, and the world would probably make a lot more sense. But in reality, the only thing that you need to succeed in a debate is to be convincing, which doesn't require being right or having good arguments. See, here's the thing. Humans are stupid. We like stories and narratives and appeals to our biases more than we like facts or logic. And if we're not thinking critically, we can easily convince ourselves that they're all the same thing. And this applies to people of all political affiliations. This is why people like Ben Shapiro, who in my opinion rarely makes compelling arguments, is widely considered a great debater. Because ironically, Mr. Facts Don't Care About Your Feelings is a master of tapping into people's biases and emotions. And I suspect that he knows this, which is why he is usually enthusiastic about participating in debates. Now even though I've never been shy about my own progressive values, I nevertheless try not to make my videos too partisan. But in reality, it seems to me that the political right, at least in America, is much more concerned with ideals and traditions than they are with data and practical outcomes. Now I do think there's a growing segment of the modern left that seems to be more based on emotion and moral judgments, but fortunately for them, most of their ideas are bad to some extent by data. For example, you may fight against systemic racism because you are morally and emotionally invested in that idea, but at the same time, there is tons of data that demonstrates the existence of systemic racism. So even if you personally have never done any research on this topic, the data still supports you. I feel like it's not the same for the right. Most concepts that are associated with conservatives and the right wing, at least in America, things like supply side economics, anti-feminism, or upholding religious values, generally aren't consistent with facts and data. I think this is one reason why commentators like Ben Shapiro are so enthusiastic about debate because you don't need to have facts on your side to be effective. I was watching a stream a few months ago where two online figures, Destiny and Hassan Piker, who are both left-leaning to some degree, were reviewing a debate that Piker had recently had with conservative pundit Charlie Kirk. And Destiny, who has had a lot of experience debating right-wingers, was giving Hassan notes on how he could improve his debate performance. Pretty much none of Destiny's tips were anything like make sure you have your facts straight or make sure your arguments are logically consistent. It was all stuff like don't let him pivot away from that statement or make sure you end your sentences on strong words. And I found this super enlightening. So here's the thing about debate. Debating is a unique skill that only a small percentage of people have any idea how to do effectively. So it really doesn't make sense to encourage this universal embrace of debate for debate's sake. It's impractical and doesn't really help anything. In fact, a poor debate performance, especially one in front of an audience, can even harm your cause. Watching that Hassan Piker clip, I remember thinking, this is so exhausting. Sure, being right and having the facts should be enough. But again, stupid monkey brain. Ain't that right, Sir Applesauce? <laughs> now when it comes to civility, I can sympathize with that. I'm a big fan of civility. In general, if you're not being civil, there's a good chance you're being an asshole. And it's not okay to be an asshole, even if you're right. Civility is also very useful in debates, because being civil makes you appear more reasonable and more credible, and thus more convincing. The problem with calls for civility is that they are not usually applied nor enforced practically nor consistently. Most people have personal stakes in political topics, and for some people it's literally life or death. So if you tell someone, Let's debate about whether or not you and or people you care about deserve to live or to have rights, and you better be civil. That's somewhere between unreasonable and just plain cruel. 
I've also noticed that calls for civility are disproportionately levied at the left, while commentators on the right seem to be allowed to be as shitty as they please. So say if a person intentionally misgenders a trans person to their face, and she threatens to whoop his ass. If you're only upset with her, then you're being inconsistent in your call for civility. And I see this kind of thing all the time. In fact, I think many of these right-wing provocateurs specifically take advantage of this immunity the press and public seems to have given them to being civil. Some ideas are inherently uncivil. If you're arguing that a person's identity is invalid, it doesn't matter if you say it calmly with a nice haircut. That's incredibly disparaging. See, do you always have to fight with everybody? I can't don't! You just, can't we you were just having such a nice time, but I you know. always invite such awful people on your show. These are not... They're so stupid. Look at... No, come on, you need, to, you need to start uh, inviting higher <laughs> IQ guests or this I'm is gonna be a disaster. Yeah, the, That's what first, of all, first of all, wait. The, these are very high Wait, hold on, Bill. You can go fuck yourself, all right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but the thing about it, it's often not even said calmly. Yet people still rush to condemn the left for being uncivil or to make fun of them for being triggered. Even more frustrating is when their incivility is acknowledged, but speakers on the left are urged to basically tolerate it lest they become even more uncivil. I mean, fascists are already killing people. I'm not sure how much more uncivil you can get. But if you say something infuriating, it should be no surprise to you if someone gets angry. Calls for civility are generally just disingenuous concern trolling. And I know I said that being civil can help you make convincing arguments, but honestly, so can being angry. And here's my thing. All that shit I just said notwithstanding, debate is effective undeniably. It's usually not very effective at changing the mind of the person that you're actually talking to, but it can be extremely effective at reaching out to the people who are listening. And I think that's why the right loves to debate so much. Progressives often have this smug incredulity where it's like, you should already know better and I shouldn't have to explain it to you. And I've even been guilty of that. And maybe it's even true sometimes, but it's damn sure not convincing. Neither are insults or social media callouts, but you know what is? Arguments, if you're good at making them. Even more convincing than making arguments is demonstrating why opposing arguments are wrong, especially in real time in front of a person who's actually making those arguments. People like myself who talk about politics publicly a lot often get challenged to debates, and I've always thought that was pretty obnoxious because it's very clearly designed to be a spectacle, like political showdown tonight at nine. It never really feels like an honest search for truth. It's just content, really. But over time, I've come to believe that there's no reason why the left shouldn't use debate as one of its tools. Considering that so many of our political discussions happens online in front of an audience. Now this may sound weird, but I think political debates very rarely in and of themselves themselves get us anywhere closer to the truth. Honest, private, one-on-one -on -one conversations are very good if everyone involved comes in good faith, but public debate rarely looks like that. Public debate is all about convincing the audience, particularly those who are on the fence. And I don't think it matters if there are three people listening or 300,000 people listening. And like I said, I don't think you necessarily have to have the facts on your side to be convincing, but wouldn't it be good for the world if the most convincing debaters were the people who did have the facts on their side? While we do have stupid brains that resist anything that confronts our biases, there are still people out there who will at least eventually change their minds when confronted with enough evidence. But that evidence should probably be part of a story. It needs to be presented strategically and not just condescendingly shouted on Twitter. It would be great if we could find a way to reprogram millennia of human conditioning. And don't get me wrong, I 100% think that we should be encouraging critical thinking and developing those skills. But in the meantime, there's human lives at stake. And I also understand that there are some people on the left who have no real interest in trying to fix the world. Maybe they've lost their optimism about the whole thing. Some people are just fed up and just wanna yell at people on the internet. And I mean, that's frustrating. I don't think that's a good way to be, but I guess those are not the target audience of this video, so carry on, I guess. But for those who actually want to try and make things better and expose people to your ideas and convince them that they are the right ideas, it would be unwise to disregard tactics that are actually effective at doing those things. And I'm starting to think that debate is probably one of them, but 
That's just me though. What do you think? Thanks for watching and thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video. Audible is a leading provider of digital audiobooks and other audio products. The available content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio, shows, news, comedy, and much more. With the membership, you get 30% off every regularly priced audiobook as well as one free audiobook every month. But my viewers can get a 30-day trial if you go to audible.com slash T1J or if you text the code T1J to 500500. And when you do this, you'll get your first audiobook as well as two Audible originals completely free. And this isn't like other services where you rent or stream your content. With Audible, you own your books. After you sign up, I recommend checking out Yes, We Still Can by Dan Pfeiffer, the former advisor to President Barack Obama and current co-host of Pod Save America, for an insider perspective of how politics has changed since the Obama presidency, as well as advice for progressives in the Trump era. Once again, go to audible.com slash T1J or text the code T1J to 500-500 if you'd like to check out a free 30-day trial and get your first audiobook for free. And remember, by supporting sponsors like Audible, you not only get access to a great service, but you also support me and help me take my content to the next level.